Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is the Night Parade Podcast, the show where we shine light on the dark. Each episode, we present to you a case on all things true crime and paranormal. As always, we'll be your hosts. My name is Glenn. And my name is Jan. And we work together here with the team at Night Parade Studio to bring you the show. All right, warning guys, this case contains content surrounding topics of sexual abuse, torture, gore, adult dialogue, insertion of foreign objects, and murder. Uh, man, so it's this one's really bad, guys. Uh, some consider it to be the worst crime in human history ever done to a single person. So if you're sensitive to these topics, especially of sexual abuse, this is your chance to click out now. That's right, guys. Watch out because this one is very gruesome and we're going to cover it in detail. This is actually a very infamous case in the true crime community. Here's Junko Furuto. 44 Days in Hell. Let's get started. Let's do it. Junko Furuta. Here's, here's her picture. Um, she was born in Misato, in the Saitama Prefecture of Japan. She lived with her mother, father, older brother, and younger brother. She was a high school student. Uh, she had a part-time job at a plastic molding factory. She was saving up for a big high school graduation trip, too. She was going to be hired at an electronic store after she graduated. So she had a lot of plans, you know, everything lined up for her right after she graduated. Right, right. It was pretty promising for her. Mm -hmm. In school, she was very popular, said to be very pretty. Most of her classmates loved her. She did outstanding academically as well. Mm -hmm. She got lots of attention from the boys in her class, and this made lots of people jealous. Some of the boys were actually affiliated with the Yakuza. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it's the pretty much the Japanese mafia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, however, most of them thought that Junko was boring because she didn't drink, smoke, or do drugs. She was very mature and responsible for her age. Mm. One thug in particular grew feelings for her. His name was Hiroshi Miyano. Here's what he looks like. He was uh, a high school dropout, known for getting in trouble, he had anger issues at a young age, so his parents actually entered him into judo, and you know they thought that this would be a good way for him. You know, it's a good outlet for his anger. Mm. But apparently, this is how he learned violence. Yeah, and I he, can see how that led to his violence. Yeah, yeah, me too. He did this throughout middle school and high school. It said that he would kick and beat his own mother. After he dropped out of high school, he began robbing people as his source of income. Wow. So, I mean, he eventually joined the Yakuza because right. obviously that's not, you know, so That was kind of like the path that he was taking or showing already. Mm -hmm. Sensei Hiroshi asked Junko out on a date to which she rejected. And this might have been what sparked his rage towards her. Mm -hmm. But we don't know exactly for sure. Mm -hmm. Apparently, this is when Hiroshi got together with a few of his lower level Yakuza buddies. They had to plan to get revenge on Junko. And his buddies consisted of three Yakuza members, 17-year-old Joe Ogura, 16-year-old Shinji Minato Nobuharu, 17-year-old Yasushi Watanabe. And so Hiroshi was also 18 at the time. Together, these boys would usually rob people on the streets, and they actually had a history of gang raping girls before this incident. These guys are just up to no good. Yeah. And it shows. It really shows. Oh, yeah. So in November 25th, 1988, Junko was 17 year old and riding her bike home from work. It was about 6.30 p.m. when suddenly Shinji comes out of nowhere and he pushes Junko off her bike onto the ground. Shinji is a complete stranger to Junko. They've never met before. So Junko thinks that she's getting mugged. Hiroshi was conveniently across the street when this happened. He ran across the street and scared off the boy. And he then offered to escort Junko home. She didn't want to risk getting attacked again so she accepted the offer. She recognized him from school and thought, why not? I know him. Junko had no idea what Hiroshi had in store for her. Hiroshi took Junko to an abandoned warehouse. Then he revealed his Yakuza connections to her. He says if he doesn't do what he says, someone from the Yakuza will come to her house and kill her. Junko is terrified by this and does everything that he tells her. This is when Hiroshi began to rape her over and over again. Then he took her to a hotel, and then he called his friend Joe Ogura and Yasushi Watanabe. They then took turns on assaulting her. 
At 3 a.m., they all met up at the park, and it was Hiroshi, Joe, Shinji, Yasushi, and Junko. They all went through her personal belongings. They found out her address, so they then threatened that if she tries to escape, they would come to her house and kill her family, not just her. Junko recognizes Shinji as the boy who pushed her off the bike, and she realizes that the whole thing was a trap all along. She was then taken to Shinji's house, and there, she was held for 40 days as a prisoner. Shinji's parents knew about his Yakuza ties and they were scared to do anything against him. At first, they tried to have Junko pose as his girlfriend. The very next day, Junko's parents called the police and organized a whole search for her. After seeing this on TV, Hiroshi and his boys force Junko to call her parents. They make her say that she's doing okay and that she just ran away to her friend's house and to beg them to stop the search because they were scared that they were going to find her. Wow. Which is pretty insane. But her being scared, she did all of that. For the next 38 days, Junko was forced to be their toy. They beat her relentlessly, raped her countless times in a day, and it was estimated over 500 times throughout her captivity within 48 days or 44 days. With all this happening, they bragged about all of this to their friends. Oh man, the, the stuff that she had to endure. Yeah. And we're only at the beginning, guys. So here's a picture of everybody involved in the events that would take place. 44 days in hell. So Junko was forced to be naked all the time. Even when they forced her to sleep on the balcony, they would tie her wrists to the ceilings and use her as a punching bag too. Damn. She was burned with cigarettes, also forced to dance naked in front of them. They invited all their friends to come over and have their way with her. In the first few days, at least 30 of them raped her. Even women came to see. It's known that a young girl drew on her face with a pen. Then, by day 7, she was basically stripped of humanity. They treated her worse than a pet, actually. Sometimes they shoved her into the freezer for hours, still naked. Shinji's brother was living with them at the time as well. And he didn't do much except warn them that she was going to die at this point. His parents were too scared of him to do anything at this point as well. Apparently, they were also too scared of losing their good reputation. By day 10, Junko's body was starting to fail her. Because of the endless beatings, there was so much blood that had accumulated in her sinuses, she could no longer breathe from her nose. Before, they were at least giving her a little food. Now, she was being forced to eat her own feces and urine or live cockroaches. Anything she ate, though, she would instantly throw up. This would lead to severe dehydration. Anytime she'd vomit, the boys would get angry and beat her even more. This continued in an endless cycle. Eventually, somebody who came to see Junko actually felt bad for her, and he confided within his brother, who told the police. So then two officers were sent to check out what was happening at the Nobuhara house and his parents answered the door. They stated that there was no girl living in the house and they even offered to, that, to let the police come in and check it out. To which they refuse. They think that their offer is proof enough that there's no girl in the house. Wow. Then the police leave without bothering to confirm a single thing. Missing a crucial opportunity to save Junko. Damn. Dang, they, they could have saved her right then and there if they just checked. Yeah. Day 20, Junko was unable to walk. They had poured lighter fluid on her legs and set them on fire. This was on top of the severe muscle damage from all the beatings. She couldn't grip anything with her hands because they had been smashed with dumbbells to the point her bones were crushed and her fingernails were shattered. One night, the boys got rowdy and drank too much. Junko took this opportunity to crawl downstairs and call the police. An officer picked up and began to speak. Then one of the boys grabbed the phone from behind her and told the officer, I dialed by mistake. Then Junko was pulled back into the bedroom where she was punished. They did this by pouring lighter fluid on her and setting her on fire again. From this point on, she begged and begged them to just kill her and be done with it. Right. They started experimenting with new ways to torture her. Sometimes one boy would hold her against the concrete and the others would jump on her. This caused severe internal damage. 
So day 30, Junko lost control of her bowel movements. She could no longer urinate properly. She suffered severe damage to her genitals. After they had been burned with cigarettes, they had forced various foreign objects into all the holes in her body. And many of them are sharp and jagged, including but not limited to iron bars, roast, roasting needles. Like a skewer? Oh, roasting needle. I thought you meant like rusted needles, but roasting needles like chicken skewers, scissors, bottles, both broken or not, light bulbs, and fireworks. The fireworks were inserted into her ears as well. Her eardrum was damaged so bad she was nearly deaf. Her hands and feet were so badly damaged it took, it took her over an hour to crawl to the bathroom. Oh my god. At this point, Junko's body was in such a horrific state that she began to smell like a rotting corpse. The boys were no longer attracted to her. They used the same strategy to abduct and gang rape another 19 year old woman. However, they let this girl go unlike they did to Junko. Over her 44 days of suffering, she endured some of the worst torture any human being can imagine. Some of what she had to endure includes being raped multiple times every day, sometimes 12 men in one day. Many of the men also urinated on her. She was forced to pleasure herself for their amusement. She was beaten every day with golf clubs, iron rods, bamboo sticks, and many more. Her head was stomped against the ground, face first, multiple times. She had dumbbells dropped all over her body. The drops on her abdomen were really hard that she lost control of her bowels. They poured hot wax all over her face with a focus on her eyelids. Her eyelids were also burned with cigarettes. She had her left nipple ripped off by a pair of pliers. Oh God. Her breasts were stabbed with sewing needles sometimes leaving the needle inside her breasts. Her genitals were burned with cigarettes and lighters. They inserted a hot light bulb into her vagina and moved it around until it shattered. By the end, she was unrecognizable. She was constantly heavily bleeding from her genitals and she struggled to breathe over and over so day 40 january 1st junko spent new year's day alone three days later something happens some people say that they challenged junko to a game of mahjong and it said that she won the game and that's what set the boys off but what actually happened is all three boys went out to play mahjong at a public place that night there they lost the game and then they came back to take it out on Junko. They beat her so bad that she started getting blood on the boys, but they were still angry. So they wrapped her wounds in plastic so they could still keep beating her. This final attack lasted two hours. In her horrible condition, Junko finally passed away. The next morning, Shinji's brother found her body in his room and he tells Shinji and the rest about what happened and all five of them they go to check out her body and Hiroshi panics when they finally realize she's dead. In this panic they all wrap her body in several blankets. They stuff it into a travel bag. They put that travel bag in a five gallon drum. Then they fill that drum with concrete. Then they dispose of the drum in a concrete truck. So they didn't realize this at the time and we'll show a picture on the screen for those of you watching on YouTube. Some of the hair was actually sticking up from the top of the drum where they filled the concrete. January 23rd, 1989, Hiroshi and Joe were arrested in connection to the gang rape of the girl they let go. Mm. During the interrogation, the, they questioned the boys about the, a double homicide that recently happened that was unrelated to this case. And so the boys actually thought they were asking about Junko. The boys were in separate interrogation rooms and Hiroshi thought that they were asking about Junko, like I said, and he assumed that Joe spilled the beans about her. Mm. 
Right then and there, Hiroshi confesses to everything. He tells the police where to find the body, and you know, in the concrete and everything. And the police are extremely surprised to find this out. Right. To them, you know, Junko was safe and sound. Mm-hmm. They, they thought they, that she was staying at a place, you know, at her friend's place. Right. Because she ran away. And they didn't know that she was in danger at all. So the police search the area and they find Junko's body in its horrible condition. It was still unrecognizable and they had they actually had to identify it through her fingerprints. That same day Hiroshi and Joe were arrested again, as well as Yasushi, Shinji, and Shinji's brother. Mm-hmm. At the time, all the identities of the boys were kept anonymous because they were underage until a news article came out. Their names were found out and released to the public. It stated that they were inhuman and didn't deserve human rights. Right. All the boys later pled guilty to committing bodily injury resulting in death. Note that this is not murder. So, you know, the people don't really know this, but the the justice system in, the, in, in Japan is geared towards, you know... Uh, helping the youth instead of punishing them. Right. Yeah. Because if you know that if this happened in the U.S., those boys would probably get put to death. For sure. So during the trial, Junko's mother had a mental breakdown after hearing everything that was done to her daughter. Oh, gosh. Man, I can't even imagine. Yeah. She had to stay long-term at a psychiatric place because of this. Oh, my God. Her family. Okay, so let's talk about the sentencing. Hiroshi was sentenced to 17 years in prison. He tried to appeal, saying it was too long. He should have been there for life, honestly. Sentenced for life. Seriously. The judge actually upped it in response to 20 years, <laughs> That's good. which is still really low for something like this. But right, right. At least he upped it. Uh, so he's supposed to be released by the age of 38. So the court ordered Hiroshi's family to pay Junko's family. Mm -hmm. They actually had to sell their home to make the payment. Shinji was sentenced to four to six years in prison. He also tried to appeal. The judge upped it to five to seven. (laughs) Still really low though. Five to seven years. Yeah, but I like this judge. (laughs) You know, like they were trying to appeal to him like, come on. I already gave you the lowest. Plus two. (laughs) That's pretty cool. Yeah. (laughs) Then there's Joe Ogura. He was sentenced to eight years in prison. His fellow inmates actually said that he would brag about the crime. Fucking douchebag. Fucking dickhead. Yeah. Some people say it was because of their Yakuza connections that their sentencing was so low. I think that's... That's probably what has to do some with it. April 2nd, 1989. Junko's funeral is held. The people of the community actually tried to appeal to the court, saying that the sentencing was too short, of course. But the court would not budge for some reason. Junko's high school actually awarded her a diploma so she could graduate with her class still. Hmm. That's nice. And the electronic store she was supposed to work for actually gave Junko's family the uniform she would have worn, and they placed it in her casket. And as of today, 2022, Hiroshi applied for parole and was denied in 2004. He was later released in 2009 after serving 18 years in prison. He changed his name to Hiroshi Yokohama, and in 2013, he was arrested again for fraud. This guy just cannot straighten up. (laughs) But later, he was released due to not enough evidence. Now he walks free. Shinji was released in 1997 at 22 years old, and he also changed his name to Nobuharu. Nothing happened to his parents or brother. However, Junko's parents recently won a lawsuit against them. Shinji was arrested again in 2019 or 2018 for beating a man, a 32-year-old man with a metal rod and also slashing his throat with a knife. There's not much known after that. Now, Yasushi Watanabe was released in 1998 at 24 and has been living a quiet and private life ever since Joe was released in 1999 at 25 and changed his name to Joe Kamisaku. 
He was adopted by a supporter of his. Apparently, these boys had a group of supporters. For some reason, this happens with killers having a weird fan base. That's crazy. You know, like Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, that's that's insane. Yeah. I, I would never. These people. That's crazy. Later in life, Joe had a job and a girlfriend. In 2004, he was arrested for assaulting a man. He believed his girlfriend was cheating on him with this man. And on this occasion, he tracked him down, beat him, and threw him into the backseat of his truck. He drove to a bar that his mother owned, then continued to beat him for another four hours. After this happened... He was sentenced to seven years in prison and was released in 2011. It's also said that Joe's mother would visit Junko's grave frequently and there she would vandalize it, saying that Junko had ruined her young boy's life. Oh my god. What the heck? Bro. What is this lady thinking? Joe's mother is crazy. <laughs> Yeah, screw Joe's mother. <laughs> Joe's mother is crazy. Oh my god. How is it Junko's fault? Her boy is the one who did all these crazy stuff to Junko. Yeah. All the stuff that Junko had to endure exactly. because of Joe. Oh man, it's just it's so frustrating that all these guys got away with it. Everybody's walking free. Ex- yeah, except Junko. It's just it's not fair. They're it's not fair. The that just sucks. It just sucks. Yeah, they should have never been released from prison. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This was an awful case. Horrible. Horrible. And tragic. Oh my gosh. Poor Junko and everything that she had to go through. Yeah. Ah, hearts out to her family and everybody who knew her personally. From from the research, it, it looks like she was a great person, and right. well, she definitely didn't deserve what what, what happened what, to her. Yeah, I feel bad. I feel horrible, terrible, terrible that anyone could do that. Yeah, these guys are are monsters, and honestly, they don't they don't deserve to be walking around the streets. They should be behind bars. Yep, forever. Oof, oof. <sighs> yeah, this this case just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. <sighs> and uh, for those of you guys watching, let us know what you think about this case because we, we're really interested. It's a pretty famous case, as we've stated. You know, a lot of people in the true crime community have covered it already. And, yeah. And uh, it's just something that, that has been on my to-do list for a while now. And we, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's time that we cover it. For sure. Anyways, I want to thank you guys for watching. This was the horrific tragedy of Junko Furuka's torture and death. My condolences to anyone who knew her personally. There was very little justice done in this case. Those guys got away with it. Yeah, really our condolences to her family and her friends. Yeah. It's hard to say you like this one, but if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell button so you know when we're uploading these videos. With that being said, my name is Jan. And my name's Glenn. Welcome to the Night Parade. Yeah, how did she ruin your young boy's life? Dumb bitch. (laughs) Being being part of that for a long time, they probably... Never mind. Okay. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Oh my gosh. This is horrible. What I mean when I say it's probably... It is the worst. It's the worst. It's not probably. It is. To... <laughs> babe, babe, do you think you can um, go in the room? Hey guys, welcome back to the show. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> he had forced various foreign objects into all of the orpheus of her body. Orifices, sorry. Orifices. Orifice. Orifice? What? Orifice. Orifice? It means hole. 
Oh. <laughs> you can just say hole, dude. <laughs> they had forced various foreign objects into <laughs> orifices. <laughs> Just say, okay, you can say yeah, holes. Just, just the can... holes in her body, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Dirty. Oh, shit. Alright, wait, hold on, bro. This is gonna be part of the outro again. I think I'm gonna keep doing that for the outro.